have the next uh, presentation uh, about the application of artificial intelligence in Europe and uh, development of this uh, approach. And this presentation will be presented by Professor Anna Fabianska. Welcome. Thank you very much, Professor, for having me here today. Uh, my presentation will be uh, probably less complex and less formal uh, than the, the one that you've seen before. Um, my name is Anna Zubiańska. I work at the Deutsche University of Technology um, yeah, at the Institute of Applied Computer Science. But within the last year, I've been involved in that science advice mechanism to the European Union, a uh, science advice mechanism aimed at the successful and timely uptake of artificial intelligence in science in the European Union. So having this opportunity today, I would like to share with you some insights, both insights related to the science advice mechanism itself, but also the evidence review report uh, on the artificial intelligence uh, in the, the European Union in science since I believe that both of these parts will be interesting for, for us as, as researchers. So starting with the sum, science advice mechanism provides independent scientific advice and policy recommendations to the European institutions by the request of the College of Commissioners. So typically the request which comes from the College of Commissioners starts the science advice mechanism. Um, dedicated to the certain question. The question can be any, uh, but it typically relates to some uh, legislation that the European Commission aims to provide uh, within the specific domains. So science advice mechanism comprises of three parts. The first part is the SAM secretariat. So some secretariat is an office, uh, the unit within the European Commission, which links the bureaucratic part, which is the College of Commissioners, Directorates General, Joint Research Unit Center, with the research community. And the research community within the science advice mechanism uh, comprises two parts. So this is a group of chief scientific advisors and SAPIA consortium. So within this process related to the artificial intelligence in science in the European Union, I was involved within the process through the SAPIA, Science Advice Policy European uh, Union. So throughout those two parts, uh, the science advice mechanism gathers uh, the experience uh, and the scientific knowledge and expert knowledge from the specific experts in the field throughout the chief of scientific advisors and throughout the European academies that are um, connected throughout the SAFIA network. So there are seven chief scientific advisors uh, to the European Commission. You can see them on, on the screen. So in this process, in this specific advice to uh, related to the artificial intelligence in science, Three of them were related, were involved, Professor Nicole Grobe, Professor Maria Cruz, my Professor Alberto Meloni, um, with Nicole Grobe being the leading chief advisor. And in general, the chief scientific advisors to the European Commission are the seven highly qualified experts. They have backgrounds in different fields, and their role is to make the policy recommendations in the request for uh, the advice. So their requests rely on the publicly av available evidence related to the basic, to the topic of, uh, of interest. And this publicly available evidence is typically provided by SAPIA. So SAPIA assembles the working group uh, based on the experts um, connected in the European academies. So SAPIA brings together more than 100 European uh, research and scientific academies. And throughout these academies covers uh, the broad range of experience. Uh, we can see that throughout SAPIA and the connected uh, institutions, we can cover or the science advice mechanism can cover all uh, important aspects of uh, science and research. 
And Sophia typically gathers the evidence on the topic of interest that is, uh, that is under request and informs the advisors by the policy recommendations. So the whole process of scientific advice mechanism looks as, uh, as of the slide. Uh, so there comes the request from the College uh, of Commissioners from the European Commission, science advice mechanism, um, specifically SAPIA ensembles the working group which gathers the evidence and provides the evidence review report. Then some uh, makes the recommendation. So the report goes to the, the scientific uh, uh, chief scientific advisors to the European commissions they, based on the evidence, provide the recommendations. And finally, these recommendations are passed to the European Commission and considered uh, or not within the legislation process. So this is, this is the detailed, uh, this is the detailed uh, scheme showing how the process of science advice mechanism works. So everything starts with the scoping paper. And the scoping paper defines the scoping questions and the evidence that is needed to, to, get, to be gathered. Then the scoping paper um, starts the evidence review process within the SAPIA. Uh, SAPIA provides the evidence review report to the chief scientific advisors. They provide the advice, they attend the expert hearings, they attend the, the stakeholders meetings. There is uh, the result of this process is the final scientific opinion which is passed to the European Commission and then included or not uh, in, in the legislation process. So the scoping paper for this specific advice uh, on the science advice mechanism on the uh, uptake of the artificial intelligence in the European Union was motivated by the fact that uh, artificial intelligence is evolving very quickly and there are very um, there are a lot of different applications, uh, and as a general purpose technology, artificial intelligence can be used in any field and can also be used in science. So it can be used in science to solve the um, specific research problems, to the, provide the discoveries, but it can also be used by the researchers as a tools to perform their research and as a tools uh, which uh, are used within the research process. And although um, the legislation um, situation around the world is uh, pretty dynamic and there are different AI approaches regulation uh, in the uh, European Union, the US and China, there is a kind of competitive international scenario. Uh, there is no legislation that is uh, um, targeted directly or specifically to the artificial intelligence in science. Uh, and also the Europe is uh, quite aware of uh, the fact that uh, it lags behind uh, uh, other players in the, uh, in, in, in the artificial intelligence in the world. So this was the motivation and the specific motivation was released in the scoping paper that came in uh, July, 2023. Um, this uh, scoping paper and this uh, scoping uh, question was asked by the Margaret Vestager, former vice commissioner uh, for Europe Fit for Digital Edge, um, and was motivated by the fact that there is no dedicated and systematic policy uh, to facilitate the uptake of artificial intelligence in science, but there is a need for this kind of uh, the policy that would uh, connect uh, and complement different AI initiatives that would facilitate uptaking the artificial intelligence in science uh, for better targeted policies and its applications. So this motivation came up with the scoping question that was uh, defined in the scoping paper in July, 2023. Uh, and when collecting or gathering the evidence, we aim to answer the question how can the European Commission accelerate responsible uptake of artificial intelligence and science, including and providing access to high quality AI, respecting European values, in order to boost the European Union's innovation and prosperity, strengthen the European position in science, and ultimately contribute to solving your societal challenges. And along with this main uh, 
scoping question that came in, in, in the scoping paper. Mm -hmm. There were also four areas of interest, uh, specifically the vision and foresight. However, within the science advice mechanism, we didn't tackle this area. Scientific process, which is how is artificial intelligence influencing the scientific process and the basing principles upon which the scientific endeavor is organized. The second key area under our interest was people, which is how artificial intelligence influences the researchers. Uh, what are the skills that the researchers of tomorrow need uh, and how does um, the their workflows and their work environments change due to the artificial intelligence. And finally, the last the, the last key area that we uh, considered was uh, the policy design, uh, specifically from the point of view uh, how uh, what does the evidence uh, say uh, with relation to the policy design that would facilitate the responsible uptake uh, of the artificial intelligence uh, in uh, the European Union. So to answer this question and to gather evidence related in those three key areas, uh, the SAPIA working group, uh, the SAPIA established a working group to gather the evidence, um, to review the evidence and compile the evidence review report that would answer uh, the uh, following, um, that would answer the scoping question. Uh, so I had a unique opportunity to co-chair this uh, working group together with my colleague, uh, Professor Andrea Migliorizzoli from Itziausi Susi. And there were also four working group members, Professor Arvindo Oliveira uh, from Instituto Superior Tecnico, Professor Paul Groff from the University of Netherlands, Professor Patricia Martinkova from the Czech Academy of uh, Sciences and Professor Karen Young from Birmingham Law School. Uh, and we, as a working group, were selected from more than one, uh, more than 400 nominations submitted by the, the academies, the European academies within, uh, within the, the SAPIA network. Uh, my nomination was by the Polish Academy of Sciences and the Polish Young uh, Academy. So, um, well, we, we got a certain responsibilities when gathering the evidence. Uh, together with uh, Professor Andrea Emilio Lizzoli, we supervised the whole process. Arlindo and Paul were responsible for gathering the evidence in the scientific process area. Patricia uh, held uh, the supervision on the people part, and Karen, as a, as a lawyer of new technologies, uh, was responsible for the policy part of the evidence uh, review report. So the evidence was reviewed. Um, or gathered uh, within the process that basically com com comprised uh, two parts. Uh, the first part was uh, the literature review. Uh, and the literature review was uh, performed by the specialists at the Cardiff uh, University, uh, who were specialists in, in, in systematic literature reviews. They concentrated on each uh, specific uh, key area that, uh, that was under the interest. And there were also free evidence gathering workshops. Uh, the workshops were attended by uh, the experts representing different expertise in AI, again, in each key area, people, scientific process, and policy design. Uh, these expert, these uh, workshops were uh, held in uh, October last year, December last year, and January this year. Uh, so the experts, uh, we, we were able to gather 35 experts uh, in, the relevant, in the relevant areas of science um, from different European countries uh, and beyond. And having the evidence collected through the literature review and uh, after the experts hearing, we compiled the evidence review report, which was next reviewed by four uh, peer reviewers who were also representing different aspects of, uh, of AI. So going back to the details of uh, the evidence review report, uh, you can see the structure of the report on, on the screen. So it starts with the introduction, which sets the stage, then goes the chapter that describes the landscape of artificial intelligence uh, in research and, and innovation. So we 
uh, specifically concentrated on uh, AI in science. Then we revive, review the opportunities and the benefits of AI in science and the challenges and risks that are associated with, uh, with AI in science. And finally, finally there go a chapter that analyzes uh, the impact on scientists and uh, the report concludes with the evidence-based policy options. Uh, so before we go to the key insights um, from each of these chapters and to whatever the evidence says uh, on these uh, key areas, I would like to mention that the evidence gathering process was very challenging since uh, the field of AI is evolving very quickly and also its applications in uh, the scientific process are evolving very quickly. Um, and there is a huge dynamism in the process. So some of the key findings we were sure of and some of the key findings that we presented in the report uh, were um, characterized by the high level of uncertainty. So if you ever see the report, you will also see the color codes saying which findings we were sure of and which we are uncertain. Uh, so regarding the landscape of artificial intelligence in science, uh, it uh, needs to be said uh, that the artificial, the landscape of artificial intelligence is uh, characterized uh, by a strong leadership uh, of AI research activities, uh, and infrastructure development by industry. So in general, the public sector uh, is lagging, visibly uh, lagging behind the private sector, which uh, pushes forward the research in artificial intelligence. Uh, since 2014, the main machine learning systems were developed by the academia, but uh, about a decade ago, the industry has taken the lead uh, and now dominates the research uh, in the AI. It is uh, specifically caused uh, by the high investment, specifically in the compute, the computational infrastructure required to train the uh, AI state of the art, uh, state of the art uh, models that the industry does. So they are heavily investing in this infrastructure, and the public sector does not have. Uh, another issue is the access to the data, because to train the, market, the, the AI models, you need the compute, you need the data. So the data uh, is also mostly processed by the industry, uh, because they can scrap them from everywhere, they not necessarily care uh, of the copyrights, and they not necessarily uh, pay attention uh, to the intellectual property rights, but so they have a data which is not accessible for the public sector and for researchers at the universities, at least at some scale, at least at that scale as the, in the case of industry. And another issue related to, to the fact that the industry dominates uh, the research is AI. In AI is a brain drain from the universities because typically uh, the talented researchers prefer to work for industry uh, and well, the resources, the human resources that remain in the public sector are significantly less. So the domination uh, of uh, the AI in the research uh, by the industry is the first key element of the landscape of AI in research. Uh, another issue is, well, the infrastructure that I already mentioned. So uh, the most infrastructure, most AI infrastructure is, uh, um, within the industry, but from the point of Europe, it is also located outside the European Union, in the US and in China. And just to give you the scale, um, once we were preparing this evidence review report, the Stanford University, uh, we, we, we found some data that Stanford University had 70 AI chips. The United Kingdom as a country had around 1,000 of AI chips. And Mark Zuckerberg said the meta has 300,000 AI chips, and this figure is going to double within short time, within half a year or within a year. So this is the scale of the resources, uh, of the disparity in the resources between the public and the private uh, sector. Uh, and also, uh, we 
So from the evidence review report, and uh, from the evidence review, that AI research uh, and, well, in general, AI uh, research and research as AI has become a geopolitical asset. And again, here, the research in AI is dominated by countries like the US, China, and the United uh, Kingdom, which lags behind those first two, but still um, is in the first third. But uh, it is important to mention that European countries altogether uh, make a significant contribution uh, to this to this research, although uh, although uh, the Europe has lost its innovation leadership uh, due to insufficient funding and insufficient investment into the research uh, and development, and a fewer number of startups than, for example, uh, the US. And also important uh, aspect of the landscape of AI in science is a very vivid regulatory landscape. Uh, so countries uh, has been um, providing or has been adopting different approaches to AI regulation. Most of the countries rely on the existing frameworks which are supplemented by some additionally um, acts. Uh, and in the leaders in legislation are China and uh, AI legislation is our, our China and the European Union with uh, the AI Act uh, being the most or being considered the most uh, uh, comprehensive AI legislation in the world. So this is about the landscape. Uh, moving towards the opportunities, uh, the evidence review clearly show that the artificial intelligence is increasingly used throughout the scientific process. So the use of scientific, the use of AI in scientific process um, is, uh, relates both to data analysis and providing or, or using AI as a tool to analyze the data, uh, but also AI is used more and more often as a tool which supports researchers in their everyday works. So uh, considering the first part, the AI as a means for performing the research, um, the, the most dominant uh, applications are of AI is using AI algorithms for, analy for analyzing the data. And with this kind of algorithms, uh, the piece of discovery uh, can be faster uh, because due to the capability of analyzing the huge amounts of data, um, using AI solutions allows to find the, the relations that are beyond the human perception due to the vast amounts of data to be analyzed. It allows for faster discoveries. And so the example is, for example, um, finding the new proteins. So this is the most, uh, one of the uh, prominent examples showing how the artificial intelligence um, speeds up uh, the, the new the new uh, developments and the, the new uh, the foundings. Uh, but also we found any many many other examples showing, for example, physicists uh, uh, using the reinforcement learning to control their experiments uh, with the algorithm adapting and learning how to adapt to the uh, a, a, a environmental or experimental uh, scenarios. Or we also have seen examples showing the literature-based discovery. So more and more often, uh, large language models are used to scrap, to read uh, a lot of scientific papers for hypothesis generation, for finding the new ideas for the research and research problems that could be, uh, that could be solved. However, the evidence shows that the most beneficiaries um, of uh, biggest beneficiaries of uh, the artificial intelligence are disciplines that rely on the vast amounts of data, uh, like astronomy, like quantum physics, like medicine. So if you have more data, many, if you have a lot of data, probably artificial intelligence will indeed fasten your uh, research. However, we also see many examples, many positive examples of applying the artificial intelligence for humanities, for example, uh, where historians uh, are using artificial intelligence algorithms uh, to analyze the ancient prints 
or to read uh, the old dialects. Um, however, uh, the potential for AI uptake in qualitative and theoretical research development, uh, well, is still unsure, and the opportunities are not clear here. They might develop, uh, however, it seems that they are currently not, uh, un uh, not uh, uh, viable. Uh, and also, um, we are missing comprehensive evaluation studies about the impact of AI uh, on the science system as a whole. So although it has been visibly changing the scientific process, uh, there is no, it's too early to have, to have a big picture of how, uh, how the change works. Uh, however, the researchers are also using more and more often are using AI-based tools to um, facilitate uh, the research process. For example, for writing the snapshots of uh, source code or for improving the delivery of their papers for automatic translation. Uh, and here, there is a huge potential of artificial intelligence to improve the delivery of, uh, of, the, uh, of the papers and of the uh, different written materials, especially for uh, not uh, for those who are not very fluent in, in, in English, maybe, or those who start writing their, uh, their papers. So there are a lot of tools that allow to structure the paper also based on, on AI. Along with the opportunities, uh, there come the challenges and the risks associated uh, with uh, AI in science or adapting AI in science. Uh, one of the risks relates to the lack of the transparency and limited reproducibility of the results. So basically, uh, AI models are considered more and more often uh, due to their hyper complex structure uh, are considered the black boxes and it's very difficult to explain how the decisions were made. So this lack of transparency uh, is uh, one of the main challenges associated because uh, even if the artificial intelligence model provides outputs that are uh, useful, the rationale behind the decision is not always clear. So just to give you an example, we can imagine the algorithm that perfectly classifies uh, the disease, uh, the skin diseases, um, but it was learned or it was trained on the data which has a ruler in the case of uh, skin cancer, which was diseased. And the model perfectly learns to recognize the cancerous tissue but that because it, uh, it, it found some features uh, within the skin, uh, within the disease, within the piece of skin which was affected, but it uh, re re remembered the ruler that appears in this case. So the model output might be useful, but the rationale is not always clear. And this kind of, uh, this kind of uh, understanding and this kind of explainab explainability of, of the model is very important to, to, to to have a trust in the algorithms, and it's not always available. I mean, the explainability. Uh, the other issue relates to the lack of transparency of the state of the art public private sector models. So models like ChatGPT or other solutions provided by uh, by the industry are used by the researchers without the ability to verify. Uh, their truthworthiness, uh, their, um, how they were trained uh, without the ability to repeat the experiments that were done by the industry, because these models are typically kept in the secrecy, secrecy and they cannot be investigated from, from inside by, by the researchers. And the, uh, also, also the uh, reproducibility of, of uh, the uh, algorithm of the experiments is becoming more and more difficult with AI models because uh, it, we say about the reproducibility uh, in the scenario that every researchers in the, every researcher in a world can reproduce the algorithm and the experiments of their colleagues getting similar results and it is getting more and more harder right now because of the access lack of the access to the data because lack of the access to the resources uh, because the lack of the details of the model. So this is, uh, this is a significant threat related to using AI in science. 
Another aspect is low quality of data and biases in the data. So even the best model, uh, most fancy, sophisticated model, will not perform correctly if the data that it used that was used for training is not representative to the phenomena that is going to measure. So if the data, data is not sufficiently representative, the model can perpetuate biases. And this can be biases related to, to gender, if you ask uh, uh, value or uh, stable diffusion or any other generative model to generate an image of CEO, you will probably get an image of middle-aged men wearing suit. But if you ask a model to generate the nurse, you will probably get uh, the female. So uh, basically, this is the example of this is the example of a gender bias. Uh, but these biases can be different, and if your data is not representative, you can harm some some users, for example. So imagine that you are training the model, which is responsible for well, or which is aimed at recognizing uh, pedestrians at the crossing, and you provide images of adults. So in such a case, the children might be in danger because the model learns that uh, the pedestrian is adult. Or uh, if uh, you train uh, the model uh, to, uh, for example, support people, but you exclude people with disabilities or impaired people, uh, then your model may not be able to adapt uh, to specific gestures or specific behavior styles. And in such a way, uh, some group of users can be excluded. So this is very important to, uh, to, to ensure that the data quality used for training the models is of sufficient quality, and it's not always easy. So uh, the bias uh, is considered as a, as a threat, and not, uh, not sufficient representativeness of a model is also considered as a threat. Then goes the misinformation uh, with AI uh, based tools, it's much easier to plagiarize the content. It's much easier to perform uh, the misconduct, to generate the fake results, to generate the paper which, use, which looks very similar to the content uh, generated by human, uh, but uh, while being fraudulent. So this can be means for spreading the scientific misinformation, but this kind of papers can be published by paper mills, uh, or by predatory journals. Uh, and this is a very important aspect of using AI in science to mention and also uh, something that we identified as, uh, as a threat. There is also inequality within the research. So research is AI is driven by profit, predominantly by profit, not by people. Uh, and although AI is uh, well suited for solving societal challenges, or for solving uh, environmental challenges. The most investment is not in this direction. So um, researchers, uh, researchers which represent lucrative sciences benefit more from funding, and some areas which are not popular, which are niche, are ignored, although even uh, simple solutions in this area could make uh, the significant progress. Uh, and also what is important to mention is that although uh, the researchers has been increasingly adopting artificial intelligence in, uh, in their research work, uh, there are no guidelines or only few research institutions provided the general guidelines for researchers on how to use AI in their work. Uh, so this is also a challenge uh, for the universities and for the research institutions how to educate the researchers and how to guide the researchers to correctly uh, use AI in science. Um, another key area that we investigated was the impact of artificial intelligence on people, which are people, the researchers, people of academia, which are the researchers. Um, and um, the, main, the main observation is that uh, the AI tools have a potential to enhance rather than uh, replace the researchers. So using AI tools um, that adapt to the needs of the researchers, it is possible to boost their creativity 
uh, and uh, foster um, the collaboration between human and machine. Uh, however, to obtain this goal and to take advantage of this possibility, the researchers in all disciplines need to develop so-called AI literacy. So AI literacy and digital skills. So AI literacy we can uh, consider as uh, um, understanding the general concepts underlying the artificial intelligence, uh, understanding how algorithms work, um, how to communicate with the AI. So uh, in the area of, in the, in the, in the era uh, of generative models, the communication could be, for example, prompt engineering. Uh, the researchers should also have some ethical uh, awareness uh, and be aware of ethical aspects related to using artificial intelligence. Uh, they should also be able to evaluate the trustworthiness of the outputs of the artificial intelligence models and be able to uh, identify the information which is, uh, which is uh, not reliable. Uh, and also, uh, they should uh, develop critical thinking and the value addition to the output of generative models uh, and the generative tools should be also a uh, very important um, skill that the researchers uh, have or should have. Um, we also found some, uh, some evidence uh, showing that AI or using AI in academia can add some additional pressure to the researchers who need to who feel that they need to keep up with uh, the progress, but this is additional overhead which comes uh, to uh, a lot other overheads that are related in, in, uh, to working in academia and, uh, and doing the research. So in terms of the policy options, uh, the evidence shows the need for publicly funded structures uh, to support the responsible uptake of AI in science. Uh, and uh, within the policy workshop, uh, we had a discussion with, with the experts that the European Union needs a kind of CERN for AI or the institute that would uh, uh, put the efforts or, um, into the development of AI into uh, the, the specified entity supported and coordinated by uh, the European Union, uh, which joins all the state member states. Uh, also, there is a need for developing best practices, guidelines, and protocols uh, for using AI uh, in the research for performing the experiments using AI. There is also a need for higher, for, for researcher education and training in AI, and this should be uh, involved and included into the university curricula, uh, no matter what kind of uh, the discipline uh, is uh, considered. Uh, and there is also needed the funding, uh, funding uh, and uh, transparent guidelines and metrics for academic uh, publishing to avoid the misinformation and to avoid spreading uh, the fraudulent papers that uh, undermine the trust in the scientific funding. Uh, also, the AI Safety Institute to monitor vulnerabilities and misuse for AI uh, would be needed for Europe. This is what the uh, evidence review showed. So having the evidence review report, uh, we passed this uh, evidence review report to the chief scientific advisors who um, provided the four sets of the recommendation to the European Commission. Uh, I won't go into the details, however, they basically um, consider or point the need of establishing the AI Institute in Europe uh, for um, providing the standards of data used uh, by the AI system for protecting the research infrastructure and for ensuring that the research is driven by people, uh, their needs, uh, and not, uh, not the profit, as in this case. And at the end of this pipeline, uh, we passed or we handed the report to the commissioners. On April 2024, there was a handover ceremony uh, at the European Commission the TV studio. 
uh, which, uh, which was attended by the Margaret Vestager, former uh, vice executive uh, president of the European Commission, and uh, uh, Ilyana Ivanova as the former commissioner for, uh, for the research and uh, innovation. Uh, so the event received quite high recognition because we were told that typically this kind of events do not take place in the studio and this was transmitted online uh, and uh, live. So uh, we, we received the high recognition. And what I was specifically happy uh, about uh, was to hear uh, the um, Ursula von der Leyen's speech and seeing her Europe choice of political guidelines for the next uh, for the next uh, um, term of service of the European Commission. So she said that we must now focus our efforts on becoming a global leader in AI innovation. I will propose to set up a European AI Research Council where we can pull all our resources similar to the approach taken with CERN. So we were heard, uh, we were noticed, and hopefully uh, we will see in the future some additional legislation and some support from the European Commission for developing the responsible and timely uptake uh, in science in the European Union. So if you are interested in seeing the more details of the evidence review report that I briefly summarized and uh, the uh, scientific opinion based on the report, you can visit the website of the Science Advice Mechanism to get those two documents. So thank you very much, that's all for me. I would be happy to answer your question. Thank you very much for excellent presentation. Do you have any questions? Okay. Yeah, maybe uh, I have yeah. one question. So, uh, so do you see do you see this uh, organization structure that is uh, kind of complicated as beneficial or troublesome in in boosting uh, research on AI? So, what's your view? Well, my view is that we definitely need a support uh, from uh, from the European Commission uh, to perform the research in in AI. Um, regarding the uh, the um, science or a CERN for AI or the uh, AI Institute in Europe, uh, we had a very interesting discussion because after after these guidelines were released and the chief scientific advisors to the European Commission suggested um, the or organization that that they called EDIRAS, um, European Distributed Institute for AI and Science. CLARI, which is another organization which uh, calls for um, creating the Artificial Intelligence Institute in Europe, just, um, just uh, came into the discussion because their view is to have a concentrated AI institute, which is located in one uh, European country. Uh, from my point of view, from the point of view of the researcher which does the artificial intelligence, I mean, uses artificial intelligence in, in their uh, work, uh, I would go for the distributed organization of, uh, of the institutes, even if, it, even if it's complicated, because it gives a chance, or this could give a chance to every researcher in every world, uh, every uh, European member state, um, take advantage of the infrastructure, of the data, of the computational resources. Uh, now we've been struggling, we've been heavily struggling with the computational power, and sometimes we drop some projects uh, because we know, we, we know how, although we know how, how to approach it and how to solve the certain problems, we drop them because we know that we have no resources that we could use to, um, to train our models. So I believe that if this kind of structure was created, if those computational resources were provided through the um, European research institutions to the researchers in the member states, and if those member states would collaborate, I believe that this would be a significant um, improvement in performing the research in AI. I don't know whether this whether I ask answer your question. 
Okay, I, I will make a, some delicate <laughs> answer to your, to your answer because I love personally to European Quantum Industrial Consortium, which is a bit similar organization aligned to, to European Commission as, as your organization. And actually, what I can say, there is tremendous discussion to discussion to discussion to discussion. And okay, I have the question. I, I have impression that uh, simply this this over over too many layers, the decision layers can be obstacle. On the other hand, this certain idea for artificial intelligence is very good one. But anyway, that's uh, that's quite important to you know think also about possible simplification of the decision process, number of layers, if we if you want to be competitive worldwide, right? I mean, that's my at least suggestion, but thank you for your answer. <laughs> yeah, I, okay, I, I have another question and comment uh, at the same time. We are living in a very strange times. Uh, it, it seems that uh, we, 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 we may imagine that we don't have dogmas, but I think that one of the dogmas of our times is that progress is a great thing. We're struggling to keep up with the modern with science, with the development, and so on and so on. Maybe that's good, maybe not. In my talk, I am uh, two hours later, I'm going to refer to this in the context of uh, teaching. Uh, what I am uh, observing, uh, you said that European Commission will try to assure that AI works for people and their needs and not for profit. That's good and sounds good. But uh, as I am, uh, I like to go down to very small details. Um, if, if, I, um, if I'm using a chat GPT to do my homework in, in whatever subject, as a student, as a video or whatever, uh, if I'm using chat GPT, it, it is doing it for, for me. And I, I'm losing the chance for my own work and creativity. I, I mean, I see a great danger of AI um, in teaching and education. What do you um, what do you think can uh, can be done about it? Do you think there is something can be done? Well, I think it's very early to answer this question. I, as an academic teacher, I also observe what, what, what you said about if we ask the students to write a program, they ask ChatGPT, hey, this is my code, uh, this is my task, and then generate a code. And it does uh, uh, very well. Uh, so I agree that um, using this kind of tools without any kind of reflection, it will um, release or will. Uh, would cause that we lose some important uh, skills. So I would rather consider using this kind of tools as um, improvement or expansion of the skills that we have, rather than uh, the source that we get our skills from. Uh, we cannot rely completely on, uh, on this kind of tools. And if we do, we will become mindless. Yes, exactly. And do we have any chance Prevent. It's a very difficult question. Yes, I, 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 can't, I can't. I, I can't uh, answer it with uh, with uh, sure. Uh, I think it's the education uh, of the users. I, I would go for for this. Uh, just explaining that this kind of tools should augment your needs, not only uh, be your be your skills, but it should augment your skills. Um, this is the only quick answer that I can see right now. Yeah. It is a question to be answered. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, as you said, it's a very new topic. It is a question to be answered, right? Yeah, also valid. Thank you. Thank you very much. And the next question is from the Arena of Ashka. And maybe in the reverse order. According to the European Union, what Algorithm is tried already as artificial intelligence. What algorithm is tried already as artificial intelligence? So what algorithm is trained? I, I don't, I'm not sure if they pointed the specific algorithm that that, uh, that would be the uh, threat. Uh, our goal was to find the threats or identify the threats in general, not specifically pointing the spe given given algorithm. Uh, mainly it was I, I think I already covered these questions or just remarks in that sense that personally 
because my company, Quantum Power Systems, belongs to European Quantum Industry Consortium. And I have to say that there is a tremendous number. I was also representative for European Union versus South Korea meeting about quantum technology development. I was one of the, rep I, give a, I give a talk on the state of quantum technologies in Europe to, to the Korean partners. So I can say, as um, as a member of European Quantum Industry Consortium, I, I can say that unfortunately, the tremendous number of decision layers is not helping like in development of, for example, quantum technologies and competitiveness in development of quantum technologies. So if somebody considers real competitiveness of European Union, one needs, needs to reduce number of layers. Unfortunately, what we observe for last five years is more and more layers of organization. And this actually wor worries me that things are really slowing down. And as about AI or quantum computation or quantum computers or, or quantum metrology, European Union is losing worldwide battle despite the great scientific potential it has. So that's, that's my comment that probably we should rather think how to reduce complexity of our organization. Otherwise, we will have the tendencies as 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 they are since last five years would would be uh, would would be rather still present and and then then yeah that's not really good for us that's that, that's my comment mm. yeah I, I agree and but uh, just just to point uh, that uh, I would like to point at the end that our goal I mean as the Sapia working group was not to provide the certain solutions and uh, these certain solutions will be by the European Commission. Um, what I'm personally proud of is that the voice that the, there is a need for AI Institute and the support for the AI in the European Union was heard and was noticed and I hope that it will be somehow addressed. Uh, I don't want to Mm, discuss the details because they are not on my side. I believe that before the Institute is created, there's going to be a wide uh, discussion uh, inside the Commission and the meetings with stakeholders. Uh, but I, I agree with you totally that having the distributed and multi layer decision um, process uh, significantly hinders uh, success. You know, you know, to, to say very